Hello and welcome to Functions in Python. Today we're going to talk about functions and their capabilities, how we define them. So we've already been using them, but let's see how we can actually define them ourselves to group code so that we can use it over and over again. So for example, if you wanted a function to calculate the tangent or the sine or the cosine uh, mathematically, we could use a function to do that. And notice we have something like that available to us, math.sin, math.cos. And the thing is, is we don't have to keep writing the code on how cosine works, how sine works. It's already been built for us inside of what's called a module, and we just keep using it over and over again. And that is the concept of a function. A function is essentially a name in which we can go out, execute a certain group of code, then come back and continue with our code. So we've been using functions before. So for example, print. Print is a function, and the job of the function is to take your inputs, whatever you put inside those parentheses, and put it to the screen. Whatever you give me, I'll put to the screen. And so we're going to understand how functions, or what they are, and how to use them. In fact, how to define them, because now you're going to be writing your own functions. You've been using them up till now, but let's see how we actually can write our own functions. Understand the syntax used to define a new function. We'll see how that works. Understand how inputs are given to a function through the arguments. So we have to be able to give data into the function and get data out of the function, more, much like a mathematical function. Data goes in, calculations are done, and then we get some sort of output from there. Understand positional arguments. So what this means is how are arguments laid out? How does the Python program know which arguments go where? So if I say X and Y, is it that it matches the name? Is it that it matches the position? And so in this case, it matches the position. That's why it's called positional arguments. Understand default arguments and how arguments can be specified by name. So sometimes we don't want to specify all the arguments. We want to leave those to the Python program. Maybe there's just one thing that we keep changing over and over again, whereas the other ones are optional arguments, inputs, that sort of stuff. And we'll take a look what that means. Understand how named arguments can be stored in the argument dictionary. So we'll talk about this. We have positional and named arguments. We can actually give each argument a name, send that off to the function, and then it can store it either in the dictionary or in its positional arguments. And then we'll understand how to combine all three of these. Okay. So first of all, what is a function? Well, if we define a function, we use what's called the def keyword. So in this case, it stands for define, D-E-F. And you can see it's already there and it says, hey, here's what you want to define. So we have to give the function a name. So D-E-F starts off and says, we're going to define a new function. So in this case, let's say square. And then we want some sort of value X, okay? So in this case, what we've done is def square X. In this case, we're defining a new function called square and it's going to take a parameter called X. So you can see the parameters, the inputs go inside of the parentheses. Now, par parameters and arguments are used almost interchangeably, but there's a slight difference. Whenever I'm defining a function, the inputs are called the arguments to that function. Whenever I'm calling a function, that means whenever I'm using it inside my program, I provide it parameters that go into the arguments. And so, like I said, they're used interchangeably a lot, but it there is a slight difference between the two. Okay, and then for syntactical reasons, we put a colon at the end to say, okay, the every code that's below me that is indented, remember, just like an if statement and a while statement, whatever's indented underneath this colon belongs to the function square, okay? And then we're gonna learn a new keyword called return. So remember we have our inputs, that's what's inside parentheses, and return gives us an output. And so in this case, I'm gonna say x times x. So in this case, when we call this function, all it's going to do is square whatever value I give it. Simple function, but let's see how it works. So I'm gonna say uh, input, We're going to take a number, so we're going to say enter a number. So once again, it's kind of interesting because int and input here are functions that you've been using. So input is a function and it takes a parameter. The parameter that input takes, it can be a non-parameter. So if we do a equals input, that still works. And you can see the power of the functions that if we don't supply the parameter, it's going to give us a default parameter that we'll learn later. So in this case, what I've done is I'm calling a function called input. I'm providing an input called enter a number. So what the input function is going to do is it's going to take that parameter, output that as a prompt, wait for the user to enter input, and then whatever input they give us, it's going to return that back, just like we did with square. Square takes x in and returns x times x out. 
Okay, so let's take a look at what happens when we do this. Let's say result equals square A. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this code. So I'm gonna enter a number and we'll say seven. Okay, so we what's going to happen is A right here is going to take the value seven. It's going to be an integer because I cast it into an integer. And then what we're going to do is gonna take the value seven and that's going to go into X. So Notice that the parameters don't have to make, they don't have to have the same name. It's just the position that we put them in. Since x is the first thing that square defined, whatever the first thing we provide x, or whatever the first argument we provide is going to go in x. So a, remember, is the value 7. So a gets copied into x. So now this is 7 times 7. Because we return that, anything we set equal to it is going to get the result, which is, as we'll see, 49. So that's exactly what happened. Now, the reason we define a function here is say we need to do this over and over and over again. How we would do this is it's kind of straightforward. We just do a times a or something like that. But functions like input are not so basic. They're not so easy to calculate what's going on, like input entering number. So input needs to output the prompt, wait for the user's input, take the user's input, and return that back. And so as you can see, that's not an easy process. So if we had to write that over and over again, all those steps over and over again, it would make our program a lot larger. So using functions, we can do something that we do over and over again, and like squaring a number or something like that. We can say, here's the code that does that. And we can now group that code into one functions, and we then we can keep calling that function over and over again. So let's take a look at defining a function we already done so and then using a function so functions don't have to take any inputs and they don't have to return anything so let's come over here and take out the x and we're just going to return 49 just a literal 49 and let's see what happens now i'm going to leave a in here inside the parameter list but as you can see on line one the argument list does not match the parameters that are providing so python will complain to me and say and notice it's not complaining yet, not until we get to that piece of code. And it says, square takes zero positional arguments, but I gave one. And so all that's saying is, look, square doesn't take any arguments, but I gave one. So to fix that, we remove it. We restart and we'll say 49 and it gives us 49. Now 49, well, let's just try a different number just to show you that it's always gonna give us 49. There we go. Because we're entering the literal 49. So whatever we say after the return statement, whatever that value happens to be, that's what's going to be returned. Notice it could be x times x. It could be some sort of variable, and it will return the value of that variable. Or I can specify a literal like 49. Okay? And that's, as you can see, we actually don't need an output either. So let's take a look at what this does. And I'm just going to say print got to square. Just to show you that we actually got into square. And I'm gonna say result equals square. So as you can see, the parameter lists match up, so we're good to go there. But let's take a look at what gets printed, okay? So notice none gets printed. Now the reason none gets printed is because, in this case, we have def square print got to square, okay? In this case, notice there is no return statement. And so we're saying there's no output coming from this function. And so what is happening here is it's telling us that nothing has gotten back to us, okay? So when we, when we set result equal to square, what it's saying is, hey, there's nothing, there's none, no output at all, that sort of stuff. And so we'll get none. Notice that it's not an error to set result equal to square. Even though square doesn't return anything, it's not an error to do so, we just get none. So let's talk about the advanced parameters. So number one, everything we've done up till now has been what's called a positional argument. The first argument always goes into the first parameter, or the first parameter always goes into the first argument, the second parameter always goes into the second argument, and so on and so forth. But sometimes that's not what we want to do. So for example, when we did print, we did something like this. So hello here is a positional argument. It's the first argument that we get. However, notice we say end equals. This is a non-positional argument. This is a named argument. So what we're doing is we're saying, okay, go to the print, find the parameter that says end, and set it equal to backslash end, the new line character. And we get hello. And so we could do the exact same thing. Notice we have to name all of the arguments inside of a function. 
let's just say malt. Okay, so in this case we have A and B. We could positionally do them, say, let's say it's two times four. So in this case, these are two positional arguments. Notice we get eight, so two, its value goes into A, four, its value goes into B. And then we multiply two times four, and the eight comes out of there by returning it through line two here. And so, however, if we have a laundry list of parameters, we could actually specify them in any order by name. So for example, let's say B equals 17, A equals 15, okay? So notice where we swap the order, but since we named them, Python won't care. Okay, notice we get 255, 17 times 15. And so in that case, that is exactly what's happening. B, now you wouldn't know it on this one, but let's go ahead and divide the two. Okay, so in this case, A will go into A. So it should be two divided by one. Let's see what the result is when we do this. We get 2.0, why? Well, because we said A is going to get the value two. Now notice we're naming the input arguments instead of actually positionally, positioning them into the right place. So A is going to get the value two. B is going to get the value one. So notice in this case, we actually have to know what the arguments named are named. And a lot of times you actually don't get to see the function definition. It's somewhere in a module where you don't get to see. So that's where the documentation comes in handy. So let's put these in positional. Okay. So the first one we did was not in positional. We used A equals and B equals. So let's take a look at what happens when we do this. We get 0 0.5. Why? Because positionally we haven't named any of these. And so one goes into A, two goes into B. So what about default arguments? Now everything we've done up till now is we've specified every single argument that has been given. So in this case, we could say b equals one. Notice that it goes in the function definition. So now the different things we can have is malt one, two. So even though b equals one here, one will go into a, two will still go into b, overwriting what's called the default parameter. So b equals one will only take if we do not specify b. So let's say malt one. Okay, so that should be one divided by one. Let's go ahead and put six or something like that in there. So in this case, notice we get 0 0.5. Why? Well, because one goes into A, two goes into B. So that one is actually overwritten by the two because we specified the parameter. And we return one divided by two. For line six here, we actually put six into A because it's the first positional parameter. So we have six divided by one, which will give us six. And so by using default parameters, I can actually specify two default parameters if I wanted to. Now we have three different ways to call this. If I specify no parameters at all, what's going to happen is A is going to get two, B is going to get one. If I specify both parameters, A will get one, B gets two. If I specify one parameter, it's only going to overwrite A. Now what if I did something like this? Okay, B equals three. So let's say, take a look at what happens here. Notice we get 0.66, which is two thirds. And so what happened? Even though I specified only one parameter, I named it. And because I named it, instead of it being a positional parameter going into A, it's a name parameter going into B. So A gets the value two, whereas B gets the value three. Two divided by three gives us 0.666, okay? So that is how default arguments work. We use these mainly because for optional type things. For example, like in print, we could specify the end, but if we leave it off, the end still gets the backslash n. So the default parameter is to print a new line after print is done. Now, if we want to change that behavior, we can. But if we leave it off, end is going to take the default parameter. And so that's essentially what you can do as well. So we just specified the parameters by name, so hopefully that makes sense in how we specify it by name. With print, we've been spe specifying it positionally and by name at the same time. So once again, let's take a look at argument list. Sometimes we don't know how many parameters we're going to get. And so we have to look at some sort of list to see this is the number of parameters we have, this is what's going to happen when we do that. We could do this by using what's called a parameter list. A parameter list is specified by a star. I'm just going to call it param list and we'll print, print it just to see what it is. Okay, so let's go and say malts 
100, 200, 300, 400, John Doe, something like that. So as you can see, we have four parameters which are all integers and two parameters which are strings. So let's see what happens. Now notice in our parameter list, we only have one positional parameter, which is, but it has a star in front of it. And so what we're saying to Python is take all the arguments that we give you and store it into a list. That way there, we can actually get the length of it by using len. We could actually positionally position ourselves by using the subscript operator. So let's go ahead and run this and see what happens. Notice in this case, we have a tuple because it's, it's, we call it a list, but in this case, it's actually a tuple. So it's a read only list. Now we could easily convert it into a list and change things around. But in a tuple, notice that position zero is 100 because that's what we gave it. Position one is 200 because that's what we gave it. And it doesn't matter the data types that we give it. It can store both. And so let's take a look at the length of this tuple. Okay, it tells us we have six parameters. Let's call it again with two parameters. Let's call it again with no parameters. You'll see that all three function properly. The first one has six parameters and it's going to be stored in the order that they were given, 100, 200, 300, 400, so on and so forth. Line six is gonna be specified as 10 and 20 and then line seven is gonna have nothing. It's gonna be an empty tuple. And so we could actually position any kind of parameters that you want and it gets stored in the position that we want. Well, what if we had named parameters? So if we did something like malts a equals 10, if we ran this, notice it says, I have no idea what this is because malt is a just a generic list of parameters. But what we could do is we could store these in what's called a dictionary. You've used dictionaries before. Remember a dictionary stores a name and a value pair. And so what we're going to do is if we add another star, it will actually give us a parameter dictionary. So as you notice, all the positional parameters went into a parameter tuple, parameter list, whereas any kind of name parameter goes into a parameter dictionary. So let's take a look at what this does now. And notice it says, hey, a, a parameter called A was specified and it was given the value 10. And so that is an easy way in which we could treat any parameters. So if the user screws up and says EDN instead of END, it's still going to work. And, but we can actually error check that inside of our function and tell the user exactly what's going on. So for example, if they didn't specify it, okay. So in this case, what we're doing is we're checking to see if the parameter list key is inside there. So let's do it twice. So when we run this, notice the first one says you did not specify end. Well, that's because we specified EDN. Now, if you remember, N is the membership operator, membership test operator. We're seeing if the key end belongs inside of the parameter list dictionary. So remember, I guess I should rename it from parameter list trend dictionary this is not really a list there we go so in this case notice what happens when i call it the second time now notice it's not additive we don't get edn and end at the same time for each call everything is reset so for line eight we're at a blank slate edn goes into the parameter dictionary and for line 11 blank slate only end goes into the parameter dictionary. And so that is an easy way in which we could specify it by name. So once again, if we specify it by name, it goes into the double star, the parameter dictionary. If we specify it by position, it goes into that single star, that positional parameter list or tuple in this case. However, we can combine all three of these. We can have some positional arguments, let's say A and B. We could say anything that else that is positional, we want into the param tuple. And then anything that is specified by name, we want into param dict. So in this case, notice we don't have any default parameters for A and B. So every function requires exactly, or at least two parameters. After that, any additional parameters that are positional go into the tuple. Any other additional parameters that are named go into the dictionary. So let's print A, B, the tuple, and the dictionary. So let's do malts 10, 20. Let's do malt 10, 20, 30, 40. And let's do malt 10, 20, 30, 40, J equals John, 
b equals 50. Okay, something like that. So you can see we have three different ways we've called it here. The first one just has those two positional parameters. If I do not specify at least two parameters, Python will yell at me and say, hey, it takes at least two positional parameters. Line 10 has four different parameters. So the first two, 10 will go into A, 20 will go into B, and the rest will go into the tuple. And then the same thing happens with 12, except anything that is named, remember, goes into the dictionary. Okay, so let's take a look at what this does. Okay, so notice that the first one, oops, I'll cover that. <laughs> so in the first one, we get 10, 20, empty tuple, empty dictionary. And the reason is because 10 was in A, 20 goes into B. Now, the reason we got an error here is because, remember, 20 is going to go into the parameter called B. And yet, I specified B. So let's specify it as K or something like that. So it can only have one name per parameter. If I have two different parameters or specify the same parameter twice, we're going to get an error. Okay, now let's look at line 10's function call, which is right here. Notice we get 10, 20, that goes into A and B. Then we have a tuple that contains 30 and 40. Remember what I said, anything past A and B, any positional parameters will go into the tuple. And then finally, the last one, shows you all three different ways. We have 10 and 20, which are A and B, 30 and 40 because their positional goes into the tuple, and then anything that we named goes into the parameter dictionary, just like we saw here. And so that is how we combine all these different parameters. So once again, a function can take inputs through its arguments. We can return outputs, whatever output, we can return a list. We can return a single value. We can return a tuple. We can return a dictionary, anything we want, any kind of output that we want from a function. We just say return and then whatever we want to return after it. So let's take a look at our learning objectives, make sure we got everything covered. Understand functions and how to use them. Remember, functions group code. And much like an if and a while statement, we group the code by indenting it underneath the function definition, which has the keyword DEF. Understand the syntax used to define a new function. Remember, we start with DEF, just like we did here. We give it a name, and then we have a parameter list, an argument list in this case, because we're defining the function, and then it ends with a colon. Understand positional arguments. Positional arguments say the first parameter goes into the first argument. The second parameter goes into the second argument. So just like what we did here, 10 goes into A because it's the first one specified. 20 goes into B because it's the second one specified. Then we have named arguments in which we can say, hey, J is going to take on the value John, regardless of where it is. And remember, we even did that in the video before is where we said A and B were our two positional arguments, but we specified them B then A by naming them directly. Understand default arguments, and we can do default arguments by setting it equal to something like b equals two or something like that. If we actually provide the parameter when we make the function call, it's going to overwrite the default and the default doesn't even matter in that case. However, if we leave it off like in, in print, if we leave off end, it still gets a value. That's because end has a default parameter. So understand how positional arguments can be stored in an argument list. So if you remember, here's our argument list here. Anything that we did not explicitly specify like a and b is going to go into that parameter tuple just like 30 and 40 did over here we only specified two positional parameters so everything additional to that goes into this tuple everything named goes into the dictionary and understand how to combine positional arguments arguments list and argument dictionaries that's essentially what we've done here so just to conclude here, functions are a great way to group code. We've been using them over and over and over again. It's just now that we're going to have to start building them. And the main reason is, is because you could build a certain, what we call a library. It's just a whole bunch of functions that somebody along the way can come over and start using your library. Because if you test your library and it works great, it makes these calculations quickly, it does exactly what it needs to do, I don't have to reinvent the wheel. Instead, I could use your functions and say, well, this person knew what they were doing, let's use their function, I give you input, you give me output. And that is a great way to structure our program so that it's reusable, portable, so we can move it from one machine to another, and it's it makes it a lot easier. I could rapidly develop if those functions are already defined for me. So for example, if you didn't have the math library, think of it, you'd have to write what sine does, you'd have to write what cosine does, that sort of stuff. Print, you'd have to write what that does, that would be a mess. And so since somebody already wrote it for us, we can just take their code, because it's a function, and use it as we see fit. And now you know functions. Thanks for watching.